Good morning. I'm Dennis Van Roekel, President of the National Education Association. I'm excited that you're joining us here today with our very special announcement. And I'm pleased to be joined by Joyce Powell, NEA Executive Committee member, and Bob Goodman, a physics teacher and Executive Director of the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning. As educators, we know how important collaboration is by all of the adults that impact a student's life. Educators in their unions, parents, business, and community leaders, and all the elected officials, we all have important roles in helping to transform public education and to ensure that all of our students have the necessary foundation to be successful in this worldwide economy. We know the things that work, small class sizes, early childhood education, greater emphasis on reading math, science, art, and technology, up-to-date textbooks and computers, and highly qualified teachers. The National Association has placed special emphasis not just on identifying programs at work, but exploring ways to duplicate and spread those programs. From NEA's Priority Schools campaign that is helping to transform low-performing schools to our Breakfast in the Classroom program to help students start the day nourished and ready to learn, educators in their unions are leading the way with innovations and new programs. Today we are very excited to announce another initiative to lead the change and to lead our profession as educators. The New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning created by the New Jersey Education Association in 2006, launched the Progressive Science Initiative in 2009. Its purpose was to address the statewide shortage of physics and chemistry teachers. The Progressive Science Initiative identifies New Jersey teachers who already have the skills and knowledge necessary to be good educators, but equips those same teachers with content, knowledge, and skills they need to be great physics and chemistry teachers. The center operates in partnership with the New Jersey State Department of Education and Kane University. In just 18 months, the Progressive Science Initiative gave some 80 educators the skills and content knowledge to teach physics. That's more than twice as many as all the colleges and universities in New Jersey. And at least 60 of those teachers were new to the subject. In Newark alone, the program has tripled the number of physics teachers eligible for certification. Additional teachers have taken courses in teaching chemistry through the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning. And as a result of the program, thousands of students in Newark, Patterson, and New Jersey City are studying physics and chemistry. NEA believes the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning has created something worth recognizing and replicating. Today, we're announcing a challenge grant. Our union is putting up $500,000 and committing to raise an additional $1 million. We are aggressively reaching out to leaders of business, technology, and philanthropy, urging them to partner with us on this grant. The result of our collaborative efforts will be positive for our students and positive for the future of our nation. We'll have individuals who have the foundations necessary to be prepared for the next generation of technology jobs. According to recent figures from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, we will need to fill 2.7 million science, math, and technology-related jobs by the year 2018. Sadly, the problem is right now we are losing 25,000 math and science teachers every year. Only 7,000 of that number are due to retirements. If these figures don't make it plain enough that we need to do something and do something now, let me add a few more facts and figures. Sadly, eighth grade students from low-income families are less likely to have science teachers with regular or advanced certificates, a degree in science, or more than three years of experience. Only 39% of black and 42% of Hispanic fifth graders were taught math by a teacher with a master's or an advanced degree in that subject. And while 7.5% of white students will take AP calculus, only 3.4% of black students and 3.7% of Hispanic students do the same. These figures make it abundantly clear that we face serious issues around capacity, equity, and access. As a high school math teacher for 23 years, I'm excited about President Obama's call for more math and science teachers. And not just high school teachers, 
We need teachers of math and science in all grades. There are a lot of people in organizations are, who are talking about these issues, and NEA is excited to step up and really help create solutions for schools. The New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning, their approach works. And especially exciting to us is the proof that it shows that it helps all students, not just some. The goal is to, is to, the goal is to get more teachers to become the best science and math teachers. And that's why NEA is choosing to invest in this initiative and encouraging others to join us in this great effort. We know what's needed to prepare our students for the, to succeed. Educators and parents must work together. And with doing that, we can make a positive difference. But we can even do more with the support of business and community leaders and elected officials. Working together, we can make a difference in the lives of students and for years to come for our nation. And with that, let me hand it off to Bob, Bob Goodman. He's a physics teacher from New Jersey, executive director for the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning, and a former Teacher of the Year. Bob, welcome. Thank you very much, Dennis. First, I'd like to thank NEA and Dennis for this show of confidence and support in extending our program, the work of the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning across the country. It's a very exciting time for us, and we really are, are appreciative of this opportunity. It's also great that Joyce Powell is here uh, as the visionary president of the NJEA. She was the one who inspired the creation of the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning. And since then, the NJEA, the New Jersey Education Association, its uh, officers and all of its folks have been very supportive and given us the ability to move forward with this project. The vision of the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning is based on the idea that we believe that the solutions for facing classrooms today the solutions facing education today are in the classrooms, and it's through teachers working together that we're going to be able to uh, make a better future for our country. And that's in, if the, uh, the mission statement of empowering teachers to lead change is very much a part of what we're about. Uh, equity and access is a major issue in the United States, and I think in this case social justice and national self-interest actually line up very well. For individual students, they must all learn math and science to have a fair chance at the jobs of the future. And this is essential to the life of each of them. At the same time, it's essential to our country that we realize the potential of all of our citizens. Progressive Science Initiative and Progressive Mathematics Initiative use technology to integrate pedagogy, curriculum, and assessment in a way that wasn't possible prior to the technology that's currently available. Mathematics and science as a result become demystified, and all students can see the basic human character of these fields. They're no longer the exclusive domain of just a few students who are considered the elite math and science students in a school. They become open and available to everyone. We started with this program in one New Jersey school. My colleagues and I founded this program back in 1999. Since then, it's been extended to 80 schools in New Jersey. It's gone, we've traveled. I just came back from Argentina where we're working with a province there that's adopted our program. We're working in Rhode Island, Colorado, and the World Bank just gave a half million dollar grant to the government of the Gambia to implement a pilot for this work in West Africa. In the last three years in New Jersey, we've created, we've trained 600, more than 600 current math and science teachers. We've also created 113 new physics teachers and 26 new chemistry teachers. These teachers have had a huge impact on students' lives already. We estimate that they've taught about 75,000 students mathematics and 50,000 students science, students who wouldn't have had access to this level of education before this program was available. As I said before, technology enables the simultaneous reform of all the key facets of te teaching and learning. Pedagogy, formative assessment, summative assessment, and grading, curriculum, all of these can be interwoven together in a way that was not possible before. And I don't have the time to go through all of these today, but I just want to focus a little bit on pedagogy because I think this will illustrate what technology makes possible. We believe in social constructivism. We think that in order for students to make something their own, in order to be able to use it, recall it, and operate with it on their own terms, they have to be able to, they have to interact with others about it. They have to be involved in discussion, argument. They have to be involved in questioning, group problem solving. And this allows you to have a heterogeneous setting where students of all different levels of prior ap academic uh, aptitude or ability or, dem or achievement can be sitting together and help one another. So social constructivism is a core principle of our work. But social constructivism by itself is not enough. If you put 
a group of students in a room for 180 days, they won't recreate 2,000 years of Western math and science. They won't be able to find all that on their own. They need a teacher, and the teacher working with an interactive whiteboard where lessons have been structured by the work of many teachers together over time to continually refine and improve. Rather than a 1,000 teachers developing their own plans, thousands of teachers working together to constantly improve the best possible way of delivering this instruction. That's what's possible with this technology. Also, the, these interactive whiteboard presentations don't just have the content in them. They also capture the pedagogy. And that's done through the use of formative assessment that's directly interwoven into the interactive whiteboard notebook presentations. Uh, formative assessment's done with student polling, so frequently during the class, every five or six minutes, your test, the teacher is testing to make sure students did understand what they were just taught. It also is a process of driving the instruction itself. And this is a, this is a lesson, the direct instruction from, uh, I think it's fourth grade mathematics, showing students how to add decimals. So it's a brief, clear, concise explanation of what the procedure is. Maybe it takes a few minutes. It's a few more minutes for them to see an example. These two slides are the direct instruction, but by themselves they would be insufficient for the students in the class to understand what was being taught. We, we're counting on this to plant the seed for how this is going to be used. But really the learning goes on. It's extended in a very dramatic way by immediately asking a question where all the classes uh, have asked this question and they all respond individually. And then the responses are aggregated into this sort of pie chart that allows the teacher and all the class uh, people in the class to see the answers that were given by the students. But nowhere on this can you tell what's the right answer. At this point, the students discuss it amongst themselves and be emotion they become emotionally engaged in the mathematics and science. The net result is about half the time in all of our classes, students are talking amongst themselves, debating, arguing, and doing stuff that students like to do, but they're doing it about math and science. So math and science become their favorite subjects. This is, it's complicated to create these materials in a way that teaches everything that we want taught. Uh, we've, as a result, you don't want one teacher trying to do this. You want a 1,000 teachers doing this. Uh, we have initially written all these courses with dozens of teachers, but they're out there being used by 50 to 60,000 teachers on the Internet all the time. And these teachers give us improvements and refinements to allow continuous improvement. There's 47,000 slides posted, 1,000 Word documents. And between those slides and Word documents, all of the material needed to teach all of these science courses from algebra-based physics through AP biology and all of these math courses from kindergarten through AP calculus, they're all posted. Everything that's common core up through algebra 2 is common core aligned, and after that, college board aligned when common core doesn't extend beyond algebra 2. The result is that's demystification of science and mathematics. So now all students can learn any science and any mathematics, opening the door to address a major problem of equity and access, making physics available to all students. Physics is a required subject for lots of fields, not just science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but also medicine, veterinary science, computer science, Many of the best growing fields in the world, uh, the best careers for the future, for the next century, require a background in physics, but too few students get a chance to study it. Uh, physics is the foundation of science because physics explains chemistry and physics and chemistry explain biology. Physics uses mathematics, thereby showing the utility of mathematics to students who keep wondering why they're learning mathematics if they never use it anywhere. And mathematically rigorous, so as a result, mathematically rigorous algebra-based physics integrates science and mathematics transforming both. To have a fair chance at a great career, all high school students should be studying one year of mathematically rigorous physics, and they should all have the option of the second year of advanced placement physics. The problem is many schools don't offer physics at all, and if they do, not to all their students. Less than 35% of U.S. students study any physics, and it's often not mathematically rigorous. As a result, less than 3% of U.S. students study advanced placement physics. This is even worse in areas with high poverty under underrepresented minorities. In those places, for instance, less than half of New York City high schools offer physics at all. So if you're in half, one of 50% of New York City schools, you won't even know that physics exists, let alone be offered the opportunity to take it. Fewer than 20% of New York City students study physics or chemistry in high school, which another way of looking at that is 80% of the students in New York City graduate unprepared for the jobs that are going to be the most lucrative and the most and growing the fastest in the future. There are not enough physics, this is a classic problem because there aren't enough physics teachers to offer, to teach all students physics, so courses aren't offered in these schools. But because their courses aren't offered in these schools, they don't have openings for physics teachers. So teachers don't have a way to, uh, there's no way for a, a, a new physics teacher to get started. Also, until more students study physics, 
there's not a source of these new physics teachers. So it's a circular problem, which comes first, the courses or the teachers? And we've solved the problem by recognizing that the new physics courses must be started at the same time as the teachers must be created to teach them. One can't happen before the other. For all students to take physics, we need to have at least three times as many physics teachers as we have now. And before PSI, that wasn't possible. PSI has shown that all students can learn physics. PSI has shown that all teachers can learn physics. And PSI teaches physics to skilled, physics, to skilled teachers to, become, to make them skilled physics teachers. To get the best teachers to become the best physics teachers, uh, we recognize the fact that the teaching is the hard part of teaching physics, not the physics. We can teach physics to any student who walks through our doors. We can't teach any student who walks through our doors to become a physics teacher. The result has been that seven of the top 20 schools in New Jersey for participation in AP Physics B last year were schools using PSI teachers. In many of those cases, physics wasn't offered there at all in prior years, but in none of those cases, well, in only one of those cases was it uh, one of the top schools in the state, and that's in the case of my school where 70% of the students at my school at this point take physics, which is a lot more than 3%, which is the country average. So thank you so much. And Dennis, if you could come back to the podium. Absolutely. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. to. Well, thank you, Bob. Present. Don't leave yet. Okay. Uh, we appreciate the questions that were sent in, and I have the first one is for you, Bob. And they say, how does this really address the equity issue in schools? How would you define that? Well, in the past, really, there's a lot of schools that simply don't have physics at all. And if you believe, as I do, that physics is essential for students to have access to the best careers in the future, you need physics teachers in these schools. We're creating a lot of new physics teachers. For instance, Newark, we took from having 14 physics teachers to 46 physics teachers in three years. And they're very close to being able to offer physics to all students in the district. That wouldn't have been possible, so those students wouldn't have had access. Uh, the same is possible in any district in the country. And once students master physics, the mathematics, and all the other sciences follow. So it's a very important e issue in terms of equity. But it, by the way, it's also important for national competition, uh, competitiveness. Uh, we're, gonna, we're competing with some very large countries in Asia that have lots of citizens. If we don't give opportunity to all of our citizens, how can we possibly compete with these other countries? Good point, Bob. Another question we had is how many states do we think we can expand into? Well, I appreciate this question. It's an exciting one for me. Because after seeing the success that we have seen in New Jersey, we know we need to get this to more places. And our half a million dollars plus what we committed to raising another million, we believe we can expand this to four to six states in the first phase. But obviously there is more to come. Well, Bob, obviously the people who listened to your presentation were intrigued because the next question is definitely for you. They said, how can we get more information on PSI? Well, you can go to our website at www.njctl.org. And if you have a specific question, anyone can feel free to email me. My email address is pretty easy, just bob at njctl.org, and I'd be happy to respond. And with NEA support, we're going to be present in more and more states across the country. So while I can give you information now, we should be able to give you more support as time goes far forward outside of New Jersey. All right. And the last question I have is, uh, do we have any contributors at this time, and who are they? Well, yes, we do have additional contributors. They've expressed great interest. I can't give you the names yet because it's not finalized, so you're going to need to stay tuned so that you can hear the next announcement when we name our official partners. Bob, I just want to thank you for being here. This was really a great opportunity to talk about exciting news about what we could do to change what's happening to students and really change what's happening for America. If you have additional questions, you may submit those to newsdeadline at nea.org, newsdeadline at nea.org. So thank you, Bob. Thank all of you for being here with us this morning. We appreciate your attendance.